so, I, so I'm really not going to have to, wow, I'm going to have to be, okay, there we go. I can use my normal overbearing tone, which frightens small children and makes babies cry. Should I, see it? I'm not used to being filmed. Are we, are we still good to go? Should I go back? Okay. Um, okay. I got stuff. I got stuff coming out my ears. I got two Mac Pluses waiting to be turned into fish tanks. Uh, I shouldn't admit that, should I? Yeah. So, yeah. I had kids. And I don't know if you've noticed this about kids, but you know, they take a little bit of room. But they move around and they start getting all the interesting stuff in the house. They find the, you know, the lock picks and they shove them in their nose. And, and they find the sharp knives and they cut off fingertips. And pretty soon your wife is standing there going, you know, this crap needs to go somewhere. Oh, well, I already got a couple of cars in there and I ran out of space. And then they start getting these big, big plastic toys. They go everywhere. And then you got grandparents. It's like, Oh, well, the other grandparents bought Timmy a little car? Well, we'll buy him a two-seater. <laughs> Thanks, Ma. So I needed space, desperately. Six hundred pounds an engine. Well, th those take up room. So he took this garage built in 1970 with little two by four rafters, and he said, "Hey, you know what I should do? I should hang some wood from those rafters and put the engines up there." Now the rafters are the triangle thing, the trusses that hold the roof up. So the engines went up, 
And for a while, they said, I can do it. Uh, but after a while, no matter how long you say, I think I can, I think I can, you can't. So they pulled apart. I knew this when I bought the house 10 years ago. And I said, in two years, I'll rebuild the garage. First thing I did was I put a floor jack on it. I put things together with plumber's strap. Don't laugh. The tensile strength of plumber's strap is amazing. Uh, that held for 10 years. Okay, two pieces <laughs> snapped, but I replaced them. <laughs> but the problem was there was a bow in the roof line like this. There was a 14-inch drop in the middle, which was better than when I, dropped, when I bought it because it was a 40-inch drop in the middle when I bought it. <laughs> now, now, any sane person would look at this and say, we're scraping the garage. And I talked to quite a few carpenters who are sane people. And they looked at my project and said, you're a dumbass. Nobody in their right mind to tackle this project. It's labor intensive. It's too expensive. Um, we won't touch it. We'll scrape it. We'll build you a new one bigger, better. Uh, it'll make the little $6 million man sound when the door opens. Uh, I said, wow, neat. What's this going to cost? We should be able to keep it under $35,000. $35,000? That's a third of what I paid for my house. Uh, I said, really, 35? Said, well, unless you want it insulated, then we'll do 42. OK, hey, um, I'm going to take a big old pass on that. And I started adding up uh, parts myself. I can read. Turns out it's a useful skill. Uh, <laughs> who knew? So a lot of this stuff is written down, and I'll get to that in a minute. So the garage is falling apart. I've got a buck 35. I need to fix my garage. I got motorcycles, I got cars, I really want to put neighbor up the alley um, had a new garage built and they were starting work right as I was getting lumber delivered and watching these two guys work I knew I can do at least that well <laughs> they were actually it turns out they were a lot better than I thought but uh, I did do at least that well it just took me longer uh, yeah willful over engineering I have uh, 
I, I have 13 inches of insulation in the, in the garage of my roof, uh, the roof of my garage, which means when I park a car in the winter, it's not fully insulated, but it's already to the point when it's 40 degrees outside without running the furnace. If my wife brings the warm car in and I'm working upstairs in about a half an hour, it's about 70 upstairs, <laughs> which sucks because I'm insulating fiberglass. So you itch. You take your shirt off, you itch. Um, I have a mouse here somewhere. Can you see my 800 by 480 constraints? Yeah. So why doesn't everybody build their own stuff? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I don't know why everybody doesn't do everything for themselves. I will never understand why someone hires Geek Squad to install Microsoft Word on their machine. First of all, they bought Word. And second of all, they let one of these Geek Squad guys in. Uh, God, hide the good silver. Um, and take your porn off your machine or they'll copy it. But uh, people are afraid of screwing stuff up. It, it's unreal. Nobody in America tries anything anymore. You know, every, all of us should probably wear shirts. I void warranties. And then we should mandate legislation that you can't void a warranty just by opening something up to look at it. You don't void a warranty in your car <laughs> yeah, by putting a, an aftermarket oil filter on. Dude, if Ford makes an oil filter that nobody can make a competing model to, they get hit with antitrust. Wow. What a great model. Uh, so don't you need formal training? N uh, no, because if you can read and you can listen, I'm assuming you can probably listen, because you know, you're know here. Uh, maybe you can read, because some of you are looking at the screen. Um, <laughs> if you can't read, I understand there are resources out there. <laughs> Suppose, you know, in theory we have them at the school for the basis from a, some of my students. I'm not sure. Uh, This is the basic set of tools with which I think you could survive. And you can get all this crap for under 50 bucks at a garage sale. Some of the stuff you can make. You can make this. This is a fancy plumb bob. 
you use it to find out what straight up and down is. I love people like, I got a laser sight with a level. I got a string and a big washer. <laughs> Which needs batteries? What a vice of double A's. Uh, so you got your basic claw hammer here, and they, these come in all sorts of sizes and styles. And uh, I tell you, talking about hammers is like talking about uh, operating system distributions. DSD sucks. <laughs> uh, guys are like, oh, you got the straight claw and the hammer. It doesn't matter. Pick one that you find cheap. Um, I made the mistake. I picked a giant hammer, figuring bigger hammer hardware. I picked a 28-ounce framer. <laughs> I still don't have the Popeye forearms. But what I did get was a little bit of tendonitis from using this thing. <laughs> so halfway through the project, my hands were falling asleep at night, uh, which is really weird. Uh, yeah, you can't a... you feel anything. Uh, so pick a reasonably sized hammer, 16, 20 ounce. One thing I tell you, 28 ounce is good for. It'll take anything apart. <laughs> and I actually walked across the street because uh, uh, a couple who was passing through my neighborhood going from bus stop to bus stop. Uh, literally, uh, uh, opposite ends of the block, uh, the guy decided to punch his girlfriend and knocked her down, and nobody listens to you. Like when you're standing in combat boots and fatigue pants with a 28-ounce hammer, <laughs> asking them what the Effenheimer they think they're doing in your neighborhood. Um, and it's not a weapon because I was working in the garage. <laughs> but officer, I forgot it was in my hand. Uh, this, is a, this is a level, and they have these neat little bubble things. So you can tell when things are right, and here's the basic rule of anything that's already been built. Nothing is straight up and down. Nothing is level. So most stuff just needs to be close enough. That this, this is the one ah, new piece of technology you really need. It's a one-hand clamp. This is the coolest addition to any project in the last 2,000 years, because otherwise you had to get one idiot to hold it, You'd run down the little handles and clamp things together. Now this, ratchet it shut, and it holds. So you can use it to hold chunks of lumber together while you're running.
don't know. I'm going to use it. <laughs> Kids don't know the value of money. It's 14 bucks for a new staple gun at Menards. Now, granted, uh, the disclaimer on that is of those eight staple guns, three were completely defective, two were semi-defective, and the remaining three failed in this project. <laughs> right, but I did use up eight of the 12,000 staples. <laughs> I'm not joking. Okay, this are the extra tools if you, can stay, if you can spare the money. Here's a regular staple gun. These are okay and you can get them cheap, but after a while, repetitive stress injuries will get to you. And that's where uh, I put one on here, air stapler. Oh, these are the coolest things. But you need one of these. This is a compressor. This is not the compressor I would buy. There's a one that looks just like this that's a craftsman. It's a little two horse. It doesn't have a tank, so everybody thinks they're crap. But they're better than what the ones they put on tanks. And you can usually pick them up for 30, 40 bucks used if you're careful. They ran this nail gun, which fires three inch steel nails as fast as you can go without ever slowing down. Oh yeah, they'll go straight through your hand. That's why when you buy the, the, the framing nail gun, buy one that has paper collated nails. There's two ways to put the nails together, paper and wire. When you shoot a paper one, it tears the paper off, sticks the nail in. When you shoot the wire one, it breaks the little wires, sticks it in. So when I, I broke the safety on mine, because I, I dropped it 18 feet on concrete and we needed to still use it. Well, when the safety went, it started going automatic. <laughs> so you had to drop the trigger really fast. So it, what usually, you know, before we figured what it was really going on, I'd put two in next to each other and then the third one would come back at me. <laughs> but it turns out when you got a 16 penny framing nail, it doesn't have a lot of velocity. It bounces off the safety glasses. Uh, <laughs> yay, exact, yay safety glasses. Um, but, uh, yeah, the wire collated ones, when it goes through your hand, the little
I worked with some incredibly good guys in, in my residential construction project. Um, all of them were retired builders. All of them were building inspectors because bad injuries had taken them out of building. That isn't true everywhere. But I tell you what, one of the guys I worked with was the nicest guy in the world. And I mentioned it to a neighbor who's working on a project. And he said, that F wit, I can't stand that guy. It well, was funny. Because when I went to him with my plans, I showed him my plans, I said, what do you think? Do you think it's good enough? He looked at me and said, no. Well, how do I fix it? And he had some suggestions. Well, it turns out my neighbor, when he went to him, said, you know, I, I pay your money. I pay your wages. You're just some civil servant. You don't know anything. Rubber stamp my plan so I can get these built. How's that going to work in a software code review? <laughs> <laughs> Mulligan. So my plans, and the plans were kind of trippy because you have to show a lot of detail. But the good news about that is you have to, you have to show every, almost all the important stuff in the written plans before you go so they can catch problems before your 252 by fours into the project. And you realize, oh, I forgot a roof. Uh, they catch that right away, and they caught some structural <laughs> issues. I actually had to do um, three revisions because my original plans called for something that doesn't exist anymore. 18 foot long, two by six boards. Good luck getting them. All the good lumber that long doesn't exist anymore. Okay, fine, you can get it. But it's going to take a firstborn child and uh, two virgins and like 20 shekels of gold. I mean, you're going to pay everything for this. So. I couldn't afford that. And I, most of the lumber yards I talked to just laughed me out of there. Your only choice is a thing called engineered lumber, which is itty bitty pieces of wood with lots of glue and math. <laughs> Turns out that math makes it better than real wood. <laughs> Love math. So I, it took me three revisions. It took me three weeks. And I was a bonehead because I used software to draw my plans. I used software to come up with, there we go,
because it's existing. If it's existing, it's fine. <laughs> if I blink at it, I got to put new safe stuff in. That'll come this summer. Um, no doubt I will start once I get the thing finished inside it. So now, I built this thing. These are 18-inch floor trusses here. I put them on 24-inch centers. I really only need to do, I think, 36-inch centers, meaning three feet between each one to do the maximum load. I'm good for a load of 90 pounds per square foot on the upstairs. <laughs> and that's where the guy said, what are you going to do, park a Humvee up there? <laughs> Maybe, if I can figure out how to get it up. <laughs> We're actually looking. The ri there's a ridge beam up here. Big board runs along the top. And uh, crap, I'm going to run out of time. Uh, we're actually looking at putting a winch on that so we can just winch a motorcycle up. We can remove a sheet of floor, pull it up, put the floor down, set it in place. <laughs> That's probably going to be three, four years. My wife is looking at this going, you know, you spend enough time on the garage. You better start expanding this house. <laughs> Come on, I want to spend more time in the garage. <laughs> exactly. You know, and the funny thing is, I met a guy when I was working on this project. He drove by and said, you know, you should do this and this and this. I said, why? Well, that's what I did so I can have all the climbing harnesses in my garage. Okay. So what we actually did, the plan initially was to leave the old roof on, in place when, when we put the trusses in. So we'd remove some roof boards, slide a truss in so we never had to take the ceiling because that's the only place the electrical was. So if I took the ceiling out, that meant I touched the electrical. So we would remove shingles and roof boards and slide this in. And this was the plan to do all of them this way. And then we'd have this roof to stand on while we put up this 430-pound ridge beam. Um, OK, yeah, that plan fell apart quick. This is what's called a 412-pitch roof. It goes up four feet for every 12 it goes in. The garage is 24 feet long. These are a foot and a half high. A little math will tell you that I have to remove half of the roof boards on each side to put the trusses in making the top this wonderful little slippery slide thing. You'd walk around and it'd rock under you. Um, so we gave up on that. But here, see this piece of chipboard? We couldn't get it down between the rafters. There was no way to get it out of the garage before we started the project. It came with the garage. So we had to pick it up and set it on top of trusses as we moved others in. And this is also where we found out the nice uniform 24-inch trusses. The garage is not uniformly 24 inches wide. I measured at the front and the back. It's 24 inches or 24 feet, 4 inches in the middle, so it's bowed a little.
I said, no, uh, Joe already talked to me. Uh, we can't get a crane in there. <laughs> so I'm thinking about this, thinking, you know, people built heavy crap before they had cranes. So what do you do? Well, yeah, these are actually, oh, crud. How did I do that? Did I really? Yes, you did. Uh, okay. The touch pads and me do not get along. I should have plugged the mouse in. Okay. These are called micro lambs. They're thin pieces of wood laminated together. They're ridiculously strong. They're much stronger than real lumber. Um, unless you lay them like this, that compromises structural integrity. <laughs> Watch every construction site they lay them on their sides. The manufacturer says specifically, you do this, you void all warranties. They have to be on edge. I told the lumberyard that, and they laughed at me. Ah, if we'd had a problem with it, we'd know by now. <laughs> Code of Hammurabi, buddy. OK. We built a siege engine. <laughs> so seriously, we're thinking, how do we lift this thing up? We'll build a crane in place. And you know, my dad says, you know, God, if only we could get a couple of sawhorses under it. And I'm thinking, well, Lifting strength is kind of the same as pull, you know, pulling and pushing. As long as it's vertical, it's fine. So I went to Menards, and for $8, I got a couple of clamps rated at 500 pounds to make a sawhorse. Then we just put 14-foot legs on it. <laughs> yeah. How do you build 14-foot legs? It involves a lot of swearing. <laughs> because you've got five-foot pieces of two-by-four up here, and then you've got you know, nine foot pieces, okay, nine and a half foot pieces of two by six, and you stick them together with a nail gun, which involves one guy kind of holding them together while you're both wobbling around at the top of the ladders going, dunk, 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 dunk. <laughs> you nail them. For
a little head to pull them up again, right? Um, well, yeah, right about, okay, about, about, oh, I would say 20 minutes after this picture is taken. I went up to check the little opening we have for a ridge vent, you know, so we can flow air from here to here. Helps cold air run along the roof so that the snow doesn't melt on it. Uh, I was up here, and this one, I guess I hadn't run the nails in quite far enough because it went ping and fired down in the lawn, which uh, uh, Mr. Gravity and St. Darwin say, down you go. So my foot caught on this one, and it went ping, and I, <laughs> stuck, I stuck my hand over here to where the hole had been. But that's not covered by a skylight. So my hand slides off the skylight, and I'm flat, and I, I'm thinking, all right, I got another one. And I hear, ping, off that one. Hey, neat. <laughs> and from below, I hear my wife say, stop throwing lumber. The kids are down here. <laughs> and I'm going flat, and I'm you know, on my tool belt. Thinking, what the? OK, I'm thinking, it's only a nine-foot drop. <laughs> this one held. I took every single one of those things off before that. Um, now, this is the point at which I hired a guy. Okay, I hired two guys. Because I had the shingles and everything else, <laughs> after I popped those stands out, yeah, I'm not going up there again. <laughs> Changed pants and everything. Um, 800 bucks, took two guys five hours. Five hours to roof the whole thing. Uh, they did everything proper, code compliant. It was beautiful. Um, it, I was upstairs working in here. There's no wall here. This is just open. I was up there working and it was like uh, being shot at because they had <laughs> air nailers and they would fire in short three round bursts because it's three nails per shingle. So you, <laughs> and I knew I was getting a little close to the edge and one goes ping right here under the roof. Ah, I think I'll step over here. <laughs> inch and a half or uh, inch and a quarter roofing.
There we go. This is the cool thing. The neighbors bought fiber cement siding. So I got to take all of the siding off their garage and their house for free. At least 4,000 bucks it saved me. Yeah, and, and I got only good shakes because all the broken ones I got to put in their dumpster. <laughs> and they thanked me for it. I actually found a structural problem with their house when I was pulling shakes off. I pulled a shake off and a, whole, and a, a chunk of stud this long came with it. And I said, wow, good thing this isn't a support wall. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is actually where I'm at now, and I'll, I'll paint it this summer. Now, I'm lying because the south side actually doesn't have shakes on it yet. It just has Tyvek because it got cold. <laughs> and when it gets cold, who wants to be hanging off the 28-foot ladder you borrowed from your neighbor? Um, there we go. Now, that cold roof thing, and I'll be done, I swear, in three minutes, needs air chutes. They're a buck and a quarter for a four-foot length at Menards. A buck and a quarter, that's a lot of money. I got these chunks of styrofoam insulation free from the dumpster, cut them into place, and stuck them up with screws and glue where I had. I made my own chutes. That was the building inspector's suggestion. It's like, you know, you could use that insulate. Oh, love you guys. So, homebrew air chutes, which have, most of that silver stuff has an R value of like five or six by itself. Um, it's expensive stuff. Let's see what else we got here. Here you can see I've started putting in regular insulation. Fiberglass, I like fiberglass. It lasts forever. Um, it also gives you really itchy skin. Down here is a mixture of loose fill cellulose. It's basically newspaper treated with stuff so, so bugs and things don't eat it and it doesn't rot. And styrofoam packing peanuts. Because <laughs> all you need with insulation is something to keep air from moving easily. Hey, styrofoam packing peanuts, better than nothing. And uh, they're, gonna, they're banned soon, so you're going to have to pay to get rid of them. So this is actually, that one I need a uh, demonstration. Now, we built a, a pulley mechanism for opening the door because it was way too hard to do it uh, by yourself. <laughs> it's a good way to lose fingers. So big, big project in progress. There's a lot more pictures here. No actual pictures of injuries because no animals or children were harmed in the making of this project. 